Hey everyone! Welcome back to another episode of Adobo and Avocados. We apologize for the delay because, I don't know, it's just one of those days when we were having a lot of technical difficulties. Um, but here we are. We're just going to go ahead with it. Uh, as usual, my name is Marie. Um, and today, I have two amazing uh, individual contributors. I'm using like different words every, every, single, every single episode. <laughs> Uh, individual contributors. I know Nicola, you work as a quality engineering manager, but yeah, with me today, I have two amazing people. So first, maybe, yeah, I'm pointing this way. You can introduce yourself. All right. I am Nicole van der Hooven. I'm a developer advocate at Grafana Labs, and I'm happy to be here despite all the technical issues that all three of us experienced today. One would think it was the full moon, but it's not. But I would like to say welcome to Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure out if that. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> oh, welcome. So, Nicola, this Great is. Great to have you here. Yeah. And this is, I think, this is the first episode as well where, so if. Because if, if, if some people don't know, um, and Nic Nicola, if it's okay for me to share. So Nicole and I are both from the Philippines and we know Nicola, you're also, you, you, you also have a Filipino heritage. So I think this is the first episode in Adobo and Avocados where it's happened like that. So it's really amazing. Um, before I ask you some introduction, I think now we want to start the episode with asking our guests, what is your adobo? So the title of our show is Adobo and Avocados. I am assuming that you don't need us to explain what adobo is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. I don't. Um, so it's weird. Like I'm, I'm half Filipino, half New Zealand. Um, but the weird thing is my adobo is something actually from Philippines. I've spent a mm -hmm. lot of time in the Philippines growing up. Um, so that would probably be Uber ice cream. Oh, nice. Or arascaldo. Ooh. I think arascaldo is also called conje. Yeah, yeah. I have uh, a yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Sorry, what you did know? you say? Oh, I, I, I just said I haven't had arascaldo for ages, so I'm, I'm missing that. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I really love? I mean, I know you said ube ice cream, but I really love ube jam from Marie from Good Shepherd and Baguio in particular. You go there and it has to be really early and you have to line up and they give it to you hot in the jar, freshly made with a lid off and like a little swirl. And oh. I know you're supposed to have it like with bread or something, but I just grab yeah. a spoon and eat it. <laughs> I've yeah. actually got a few containers in my fridge. Uh, I oh. went to the Philippines fairly recently, so yeah. From yeah. Baguio, I, I mean, uh, no, uh, I think it's the one. There's like a Quezon City one. It's not the one in Baguio, but I think it's a branch more like central to Manila. So mm. when I was in the Philippines, uh, my cousin got me some. Like he's like, "What do you want?" And I was like, "Oh, some ube jam," because uh, oh. good for baking as well. I've tried it from the yeah. spoonfuls, and I tried mixing it to yogurt. I've tried it with big pancakes and toast. Yeah. Um. But yeah, ube ice cream is kind of what I've been making at home. Wow. So, yeah. Oh, it's making me crave Ube <laughs> now. Oh, yeah. There is a bakery shop here in London called Mama Sons. Mm -hmm. And one of their specialty is the Ube. Um, it's like with the Ube ice cream and then the pandesal. Uh, so it's uh, Ube uh, ice cream inside. And a lot of people uh, liked it. I think it's great that now... There's there are a lot of Filipino restaurants as well. I don't know what um what the state is in Sweden and in uh, the Netherlands, but I know even um even here in the uh, in the UK they're starting to be everywhere now, like Filipino restaurants, Filipino stalls. So it's amazing to see. <laughs> mm. In in Sweden, um, I don't okay at least in Malmo where where I live. I don't know of any of Filipino restaurants or cafes. I know there's like a Filipino food store um, mm. that opened up fairly recently within like walking slash bike distance. Um, but I don't really see like a massive Filipino immigrant population here. I know there are a few, like I've met a few, um, but that's kind of my working theory as to why there aren't any um, cafes or restaurants. I'm not sure how it is in the Netherlands. I mean, I know of two two restaurants in the Netherlands, and neither of them is in is where I live in Maastricht. They're all like three and a half hours away by train, oh, so no. <laughs> it's not <Okay>. great. 
<laughs> but Nicola, much- you sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Nicola, you mentioned that um, you are you are half Filipino and half New Zealander, but you also mentioned living in Sweden. How did that? How did that happen? Oh, um, so back in May 2015, I met um, my previous employer um, or some people from my previous company, House of Test, at the Let's Test conference, which is out just outside Stockholm. Um, I, I met them, you know, they're, they're great. And I kind of thought that moving to Sweden or just or even Europe in general mm-hmm. um, was on my life plan um, in 2016. Uh, but then when I got back from the conference or, you know, after traveling around a bit around Europe, was told that there'd be layoffs. Um, they laid off like over like half the team, the QA team uh, and some pretty deep cuts all over the company. Um, so I fast, I just changed that plan. I was like, oh, well, I met some nice people um, and didn't actually hurt that while I was um, in Europe, I had also met a Swedish guy. So I moved here with a work permit. Um, but, you know. I don't know, part of me felt like the signs were telling me to go to Sweden. So, you know, so, so far, so good. Um, yeah. Um, so here, here I am. Um, I, I moved moved for work, stayed for him. And yeah. So the it's, it sounds like there was a job opportunity and then you met your husband as well. Uh, your your now husband. So it's it sounds like the stars have aligned. Um, yeah, and I, living this life there in Sweden. I was, I was pretty yeah. I was pretty grateful because like um, as a, as a foreigner in Sweden, I know a lot of foreigners who struggle to find a job when they move for love. Um, so I kind of had the best of both worlds, mm-hmm. where I I had the job and then. Um, and you know it was it was a great work opportunity, and I, I was there for like I don't know, five years. Um, but then I also had someone to help me navigate, like to like read the documents, the official documents in Swedish, or when you have to call certain government agencies and they don't have an English option, he would call in advance and tell me what numbers to press, so I could actually speak to a human, like all those little things. Um, he went through my job contract and to explain to me um, if if he thought it was a good salary and all that. Um, so yeah, I mean. I was I was very very lucky, so I'm I'm grateful for 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 what happened. And yes, you and said that you already had a testing job. Were you at that point already in testing, or yeah, yeah, was yeah. this okay? Yeah. So I had um. I think when I moved to Sweden, I had three years of experience. Um, so my first few years was in consulting. And then I worked at a startup for a year and then back to consulting for a while. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't like my first uh, job out of uni. Um, I have spoken to a few people who want to move to another country fresh out of uni without any experience. I do tend to warn them against that, um, mm-hmm. especially if you are um, wanting to move from out of the EU into the EU because it can be hard to stand out if you're, a f- if like, um, I, I like I, I created two YouTube videos on this and I kind of wanted to like expand on these things a bit more. Um, you, you the, the threshold to hire you is going to be quite high if they have to do this extra paperwork to bring you in. So like, if you don't have any experience, you have nothing extra to offer, then from this perspective of an employer, why would they, like, on, like this sounds like really blunt, but like, why would they bring you in? Um, mm-hmm. Until you, until you have, until you've like proven yourself a little bit. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it's, I think it's always difficult because, you know, you may have an an idea for where you want your life to go and where you want that life to be, but mm-hmm. there's also, you know, the practicalities of what do you actually have experience in, and does your skill set match what that country is looking for. I mean, it's easier now than it ever has been in any time in history to move, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. that doesn't make it easy, you know, and that's just the practicalities of it and the logistics. But what about like, you know, the cultural differences, because, you know, you were already multicultural to begin with. I'm curious to see, like, was, were there any issues on that front for you and, or linguistic ones too? Mm -hmm. 
the the cultural differences didn't actually become apparent to me at first because I think the way I understand New Zealand culture is pretty like laid back, go with the flow. We're not like as friendly and outgoing as Americans, but then we're not as reserved as some other cultures, for example. But then we're not as say um, blunt as some other cultures as well. Um, in terms of aspects of Swedish culture, I have struggled to adjust to. Uh, the first would be um, how long it can take to reach agreements on things. Like it's a very mm -hmm. much consensus based culture. Um, oh, the, and the extent to which that can be applied. So maybe you think, okay, make, let's have a discussion or two. And then these things can take a very long time. Um, the second, I would say, is language because, well, at least for me, while a lot of Swedes do speak English or a lot of Swedes speak English, they're like below a certain age. So maybe our grandparents' generation wouldn't speak English. Um, it's a lot easier to make connections um, with people when, when you speak Swedish. Uh, and then like, I like, I wouldn't say that this has been a hard adjustment, but one thing I have found interesting is like, there's a Swedish saying that um, it goes like, so there's only, there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. So, um, I wouldn't see as much in say New Zealand or in Philippines to, to be willing to be outside when the weather's shite. Um, but here I see people more get on with it, which I, which I really like. So now like with my kids, um, even if the weather's not fantastic, um, you can just put on the right clothes and then just send them outside so they can go play. So I like that. Yeah. I'm curious to know, Nicola, because a while ago you said something that out of uni, this wasn't your first job. Did mm -hmm. you apply to a tech job straight after uni or was it a different profession or basically how did you start in tech? Mm. Um, I did economics and German at university as my majors. So I did a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Commerce. Uh, so I did, I did two degrees, but um, I took extra papers and some papers went counter for the two degrees um and then when I finished uni I applied to like I don't know like less uh, like 10 jobs and they were combined of some consulting jobs like the big four um and then the the job I got at Assurity which is a test consultancy and like one or two more actually can't remember now uh, the initial life plan was to become a diplomat um but oh, that cool. year I graduated yeah <laughs> Um, I had this like little fantasy of the diplomat passport and like wait, you know, like walk into countries. Yeah. Uh, very. Um, and then um, the the year I finished uni, uh, they like laid off twenty percent of their staff, and they just like weren't hiring that year. Uh, mm -hmm. And I and I heard about oh, there's a job in testing. You know, if, are you interested in technology? Are you curious? And so on. Uh, so I went. I went for that. Um, I got good vibes from the company. They fortunately also liked me. Um, and then I did a grad program where they trained me up. So yeah, life doesn't, because uh, I actually didn't, I had no idea. Like, I think like most people um, who aren't in tech, that testing existed as a career. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was like the only, the other people on my um, intake did like com computer science or similar degrees. And here I was struggling with like, I think at the start, like basic HTML or just like anything remotely technical I thought it was like so bloody difficult mm -hmm. um and yeah kind of fell into it still happy so here I am still like 11 years later nice there's some overlaps here that I can see so Nicole also did an economics major and I also did a graduate program because similar with you I didn't know that you can have a career in software testing so out of uni I applied uh, this graduate program specifically mm. for testing because I thought that if you finish studying computer science, the only jobs available would be developers, yeah, things, managers, like all those kind of things. I didn't know that testing is a career that you can have. So I'm grateful for that graduate program. But yeah, it's interesting to hear that you also did a graduate program. And it's great because even though you come from a different major you're very brave for you know for for doing that program because 
I think a lot of people would have probably, I don't know, put their uh, put in their head that, gosh, I did this major. Now I'm going to do a different degree related. Uh, I'm sorry, a different job that's not related to what I've studied. Like it mm. feels like it's a waste. But mm. from hearing your perspective, you've used that to your advantage. And now it's landed you to this amazing career that you have. Yeah, and I'm pretty grateful. But it's, like, weird because, like, the person I was back then is different to who I am now. Like, I was probably more willing to take risks and things um, mm. back then. But then, like, when I hear of people who are, like, say, five, ten years into their career, um, and then they do, like, career switches into different industries, and I'm, like, you know, I'm like this to them because I, I admire how much um, confidence they have in themselves to, like, mm. or actually not even just, like, say, the confidence, but it's one thing to, like, dream and go, oh, this would be nice. Like, oh, it would be nice to, like, become a teacher or whatever different industry you want to work in. I mean, it's nothing to actually do it. Um, but then what, one cool thing about uh, the consulting company I used to work in is they now also have, um, I don't think they call it a graduate program. So the graduate program was for for fresh graduates who, who had finished uni in the recent, like, one or two years. But there's a thing, this thing called a fresh start program. I'm not sure if it still exists, um, which was for career changers, which I think was so cool because um, it's like you do have graduate programs for like a lot of different industries, like in accounting and law and, and test and software development. Um, but trying to like get your foot in the door as a career changer, if, if you decide later in life that you want to go in a different direction, I think is actually quite hard. So I think it's cool that there's at least one program I know of that addresses that need in New Zealand. Yeah, I think I when th we talk about investing in our careers, I think it's it's impossible not to talk about you know why you might need to invest in it. I think there are some people who I don't know are just lucky or or like they just always knew what they wanted and were always in the right position. Um, but you've already mentioned a few things that could have set you back, like things like being an immigrant or, mm. you know, not not being a native Swedish speaker or not graduating with a computer science degree. So I think that when you come into an industry already behind in some respects, investing in your career becomes that much more important. And you talked about like one way that you already invested in yourself, which was doing the graduate program. Were there any other things that you can think of that helped you, you know, kind of catch up? Mm, like I did a lot of courses. Um, I think I did like, not plural site, Codecademy in my, in my spare time. Um, more recently, I've been doing test automation university courses, uh, Coursera. So um, I don't know if I'd say it like made me catch up, but I, I honestly enjoy learning. Um, I've been reading lots of books, not necessarily on testing, um, well, also on testing. But I think what I've learned in some of these books have benefited me in my career. So like Crucial Conversations has helped me with having um, – they give me the tools to have more difficult conversations with people. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's kind of weird because you, you mentioned a bit about, you know, if you're an immigrant um, or if you are a native language speaker, um, you, those are like facts. They can't really change anything about, but when it comes to investing yourself, no one can take away what you learned. I mean, if, I, if someone learns things and they become smarter, you, 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 you literally can't take that away from them. So I um, I found that pretty useful. Yeah, that's uh, really, I mean, that's, that's really great because like you said a while ago, um, we need to take that risk in order to really have that investment in ourselves because I, I know some people who have been stuck uh, in their careers, let's say five to 10 years, um, some people are brave enough to change careers, but most people are um, scared of making that big job because they mm -hmm. feel that they're already comfortable in doing that job that they don't 100% like, but they're good at it. So I think it, it's, it's, it's up to that individual as well to really take that risk and um, just make that jump because 
it, it's it's gonna sound cheesy, but we only get that one life. So you'd rather have that meaningful life, that meaningful job, rather than be stuck in, I don't know, a job or a nine to five environment where you are good at it, but it's not really something that you enjoy wholeheartedly. So I totally think it's also dependent on an individual. Mm. Mm. And it's also like what people like value at work or like like nowadays. Um, when I've had like a few people reaching out to me, the job market doesn't seem fantastic. So it's like with with what you said, Marie. Part of what I would advise people would also depend on the timing of things. Like making a jump is going to be easier in certain times than others. Mm-hmm. And then it's a case of if you're willing to to, and it also depends on like how risk averse you are. Because and like and on your personal life circumstances. So like if you are the sole er, sole income earner, then your risk averse, you know, your risk tolerance, I assume, is going to be a lot lower. But then if you have say two incomes, where um, yeah, two incomes, you don't have ch- children to support, or you got heaps of savings. Where like let's say you quit your job. I actually knew someone at my husband's company who did this recently. They quit their job and they just wanted to just take some time off for a while and figure out what they'll do next later. Um, if you've got savings for like six months or a year, then you're more likely to be able to exercise. I want to say privilege because I would say it's actually a privilege to have the freedom to make those choices. Yeah. yeah. We've talked about how taking a risk can be an mm-hmm. investment in, in your career. But I also think that one of the most damaging beliefs that I kind of passively believed or or kind of put some sort of focus on what while I was growing up and while I was deciding what to do is that you you if you choose a, a job that you love doing that you're passionate about then you'll never work a, another day for the rest of your life and why I think that is damaging is it presupposes that the passion comes before the actual understanding of what that job even is and part of, for me, I, I don't know about for either of you, but in, in my life, I kind of felt like I need to find something that I'm extremely passionate about from the get-go. And that wasn't really how it was for me because I was I could be passionate about a lot of things. I loved learning. I still do. And I think when we're talking about investments in, in our careers, I think we should also mention that there is still... For some people, like it has to be something that you build up to because mm-hmm. I feel more passionate now about testing, about tech, about development than I ever have in my life. And that's because I already have career capital. So I think that it can be, it can have the reverse effect when you tell a young person, hey, don't do something, don't work in a field that you're not super passionate about because sometimes the passion comes after you've made the investment. I don't Can think I, that uh, you should uh, go into something that you hate, right? But I mm. I think that you it can be unrealistic to expect passion to come from nothing. With what you're saying, I have to ask, have you read Cal Newport so good they can't ignore you? Yes, I okay. have. Just, just <laughs> yes. Some of the words you're some of the choice of words you're using, I was like, oh uh, <laughs> I mean yes. I recommend that book if we're gonna talk about like investing yourself in careers. Because that it offers like for me some advice that like with what you said, I, I feel like people need to hear, but people mm-hmm. might not want to hear. Um, yeah. This idea of career capital. Yeah, so let's talk about that book because I, I love a lot of Cal Newport's books, not all of them. Digital minimalism was <laughs> okay, but I, I do really love So Good They Can't Ignore You. And the whole premise mm. of it is that instead of coming into your career at the beginning thinking, you know, I am going to love this and therefore I'll be good at it. Why don't you mm. flip that and think, get good at something. And when you're really good at it, the passion will come. Mm. And I, I, I've i always found that to, to be really um, resonant in my life because I think it's a natural thing that, you know, we tend to like things that we're good at. But if you expect to love your job, then it's kind of like, but are you already good at it? It, it kind of it presupposes experience and expertise when really 
it, it's just unfair to expect that at the very beginning. You, you have to do the hard yards, you know? Yeah. Mm. I can totally relate to that because I did computer science, but I think I mentioned this during our very first episode, Nicole, that the only reason I chose that <laughs> course was because the name was super fancy. It wasn't something that I really wanted to do. It's just mm -hmm. something that, oh, I think this is going to sound interesting. Let me try this out. But my mindset <laughs> back then was this course has a really fancy name, Computer Science with Business Management and, and Financial Accounting. That was the full name of the course. And then being in that course, I was like, okay, I think I think I can I can I can do this. There's a lot of hard work because the only I mean I did I did have a background in terms of programming, but this was just editing HTML files and ed um, editing my MySpace <laughs> um, profile, but I was clueless about the other things. So there was a lot of hard work involved. And I think the more I started to learn about the different concepts, then the more I started to fell, um, uh, fell in love with it. So it wasn't something that I initially thought that, okay, after... Um, this year, I'm going to apply to be a computer science student. It didn't happen like that. So that was, yeah, it it it, it reminded me of that, of that event. <laughs> um, was there any other, so in your career, Nicola, and even you, Nicole, was there any moments in your career where you've really hard to work hard because i think for example nicole you mentioned that you've you've um th uh, this made you love testing and tech even more and nicola i don't know if you also have any similar experiences where you started off i guess not really passionate about something and then now you are passionate about it you're building something about it you're building your brand so was there any personal key experiences that both of you would also like to share? Mm, for for me, when I got laid off, um, the reason I got laid off was because I lacked his automation experience. Um, so what had happened was they decided to let go of like uh, the manual testers. Um, so then in terms of the things that was hard to learn or was um, someone who kind of saw herself as a non-technical person actually learning how to program. Because um, there are some things that I feel come to me naturally. Um, learning how to program is not one of them, or the technical mm -hmm. side is actually not one of them. Um, and and even, even now when I had to, like, before, um, pick up new tools, um, learn different frameworks, um, there's a lot of swearing involved, like a, a, a lot of swearing <laughs> and muttering. And is it in like, Swedish? <laughs> sorry, no, I swear. Uh, I, I'll know that I've conquered. I mean, I know how to swear in Swedish, but no, it's, uh, it has to be natural. It's not like I'm. <laughs> um, so, so a lot of that. Uh, so they'll probably be, with the, be the first one. And then the other part is like we're getting laid off. Um, there's like that sh shock to your confidence where, mm -hmm. you know, usually someone like leaves a company. Um, and then when the company chooses to let go of you, then, you know, it feels like a little bit like rejection. Um, but I, I still remember like when I had that call, um, I had not the call, the discussion, because there's like this, like one day where they're talking to everyone. And, uh, I remember there's like glass walls in the meeting rooms and they had like a bloody tissue box on the table. And I was like, who the fuck cries? Like who, you know, like, why is there a tissue here? And there's like someone from HR and someone from the oh, tech God. team or tech leadership. And I was like, I was like bawling my eyes out. And like a bunch of people, and I was like, "Why do people cry? Like it's just a job." Um, but yeah, it's like I guess that was like hard because um, the uncertainty was there. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't really imagine how it is for people now. Um, who, because I mean, uh, you know, I spoke a bit about privilege. Um, I, I was um, in a position where I was able to to find a job very quickly. Um, I didn't have anyone depending on me, so it's I was, you know, almost everything you could ask for. But, like, that was, I think for me that was, like, a wake-up call because, one, it made me think about the skills that you have and knowing that you should stay relevant to the industry. 
Um, and it's not like, I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't learn test automation, but I do think it's mindful to know what the industry wants and mm-hmm. seeing, do you have the skills that are, and especially for people who are at the same company for years. Um, now it's like Sweden, for example, has a very like, um, workers are very protected. So you couldn't just like easily like fire someone. But I know in some countries, you know, it's like hire fast, fire fast. Um, so that was like a big wake up call to just be constantly mindful about what can I do? What can I offer? And then kind of just keep track of what's happening in the market and see like, do I still match up? And if not, like what do I need to learn so that if something happens, um, will, I, will I be okay? Because like, it's not a very nice thing to say. Um, but my, my personal priority is always going to be my husband and my children and like the, our like livelihood as a, as a family. Um, over over anything else in my life and part of ensuring that is 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 thinking about like that am i doing a good job at work am i relevant to the job market and yeah and then just hope that if anything is thrown in our direction that we'll be able to field it Mm -hmm. how about one of the things one of the things that i think i I, one of the things that really supercharged my career was something that I kind of fell into, but then I just ran with, and that's that I found a mentor. So my very first ever job in testing was was under who became my my eventual mentor, and um, this is Dane Schapers, who was a performance engineer in in Australia, and I ended up following him to the Netherlands even. Um, so this is someone who is very blunt, very good at his job. And I, I think one of the best things that I did was, you know, I'm, I'm Filipino still. Like I, I was born and raised in the Philippines. We aren't very blunt and we don't naturally take criticism well in our culture. And I was very shocked initially at this Belgian guy who would just call it like it is and <laughs> I could have reacted in a very defensive way, like, who are you to, you know, to cr- criticize my work? But I'm glad that one of the ways that I invested in my career is that I put aside my pride and tried to listen with an open mind to this person that I knew, knew better than me. And I cultivated that. And so now I, I think I I think I take criticism pretty well. I actually seek it out when I mm-hmm. do something. I don't just ask people like, what do you think of it? But like, cause if you say, what do you think of it? Then people will inevitably tell you the good things, but I want them to tell me the bad things. So I specifically ask like, where did I get it wrong? What is yeah. missing? So I never ask anymore. Like, what did you think of it? Because that's so open-ended. You're not going to get anything useful. I think one of the best things that you can do when if you're if you truly want to learn is steer into the criticism, ask for constructive criticism, because it's the only way that you're going to be able to learn. Mm -hmm. I agree. That that leads perfectly to having that growth mindset. And we've spoken about this growth mindset from our previous episodes. But that really makes a difference because if you have a fixed mindset and someone criticize you, then you would really take that negatively. And then you probably think, oh, I'm not good at this job. I'm just going to stick to what I know. But having that growth mindset to take that criticism and then turn something out of that, uh, improve yourself, That's I think that really stands out. And I wish that, because I know, we can't really say to everyone, hey, have a growth mindset. Because I think at some in like at some point in our lives, we will have fixed mindset, we will have growth mindset. And I was reading this book Mindset um before and it was saying that in different stages of our lives, we'll be in different mindsets. We might have one over the other. Um, so it's just great that from he- uh, hearing the experience from both of you, it sounds like you were using that growth mindset to try and improve on something that you already know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it's nice to like think about also what you can control because like, yeah. um, and the big one of that, like one thing I like about feedback that Nicole touched on was like, not just like asking, well, it was not like, cause you talked about like the wording of the question, but actually asking for feedback 
because um, I I encourage people to ask for feedback because it shows that you're open to it because I think you're more likely to one get any feedback at all but also get useful feedback when you're actually saying that you're open to learning because there because so, for me there are two things that I heard Nicole say it was one you know getting the right sort of feedback and wording in a way but two you're sending that message that you want to learn and then in, in my opinion you also send the message that like going forward this is a person who is open to learning and growing because like I've made the mistake of giving feedback to people when it was unsolicited and uh and it's like the mis- well, the the, mis- the mistake that I, I made was the fact that I didn't carefully think enough about the relationship that we had and the credibility in their eyes of who I was to give feedback to them. So now I'm damn careful about what I say to people. This is like that book, uh, Radical Candor, right, where they talk about like different quadrants and, and how when you give feedback, you have to not just be authentic, but it also has to come from a place of compassion. And if you mm-hmm. don't have that foundation of compassion or rapport between you, then it can just come across as aggressive. You know, mm-hmm. so it's not enough to be truthful. It has to be truthful, but also based on some sort of real trust, trusting relationship. Um, and I also think that it's, you know, we talked about, you know, Cal Newport's being so good that they can't ignore you. One of the, one of my arguments to that is that I think it's not enough to just be good because you mm. also have to be discoverable and we can oh, yeah. get into like Austin Cleon's um, Show Your Work. That's a, also mm. another good book because when we talk about feedback, before you can get feedback, you have to have something out there to get feedback on. You can't mm-hmm. just be like, hey, can you just give me feedback? It's like feedback on what? You know, so mm-hmm. one of the ways that I think that you can, that someone could invest in themselves is creating visible work or creating mm-hmm. some sort of record of what you've done so that you can go to somebody and be like, here's what I did. What could I have done better? you know, where did I fall short? Because if you don't have that, then there's nothing to get feedback on. Mm. And I think it helps to like make your work visible. Cause I know like, um, say with testing, I've known people who like, say they do exposure testing, but they don't actually share what they're finding. So they, it, there's nothing to get feedback on. They don't document it. Um, even if they have like test cases, they don't, like it's like people, I think in testing, they focus so much on the actual, say, doing of testing and finding bugs and and discovering new things about the software, and not enough about the communication about like writing it down or talking to people about it, because people can't give feedback on like oh you say oh um I found nothing or oh I found a bunch of things and people are like supposed to give feedback on that like good luck, um, so it's kind of. I think it's nice to always like rem- remember how things look in the other perspective. Cause yeah, when I've done that, when I haven't done that, I've, uh, I've been burned. <laughs> Cause yeah. Cause like, I, I just, I just want to touch like on the, on the, on the feedback thing, my, my mistake wasn't not doing it out of compassion. My mistake was like misreading the relationship, mm. which, which, which is, which is, I, I don't make that mistake often. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like when you, it's like, you know how you, you, have you been in like situations where you think that you can have an open, honest conversation with people, but then like in one of them, they, they were happy to give feedback to people, but they could not receive. Yeah. Like they were very blunt with a radical candor with people, multiple people, including myself, but they could not receive it, which, which was like a switch to me. Cause I thought with communication styles, it usually, usually is two ways. Hmm. But in this case, how they liked to receive feedback um, was a lot, 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 lot more gentler than how they like to dish out feedback. And the other one, I think it was, yeah, reading about the credibility I had in their eyes. So it's like, okay, I thought it could help. And I thought based on what people were saying, like not behind their back, but, you know, um, the thing with with feedback is like you can't help or affect what people think of you, but the but feedback is a gift because you actually get to shine light on that information and you get to do something hopefully with it 
as opposed to live in ignorance. But sometimes people want to continue to live in ignorance and you can't really do much with that. I think around the theme of showing your work, making your work visible, you strike me as someone who has done this in different like um, in different variety ways. You're quite active in the community. I've read in your um, website that you also founded two software testing meetups, one in mm. New Zealand and one in Sweden. You're very active with your YouTube videos. I've watched um, some online conferences that you've done, especially around the implicit requirements. That was really useful. Mm -hmm. um, and you've also written a book. So mm -hmm. I read your starting your software testing career. And what was the main motivation from doing all these community work? Because you've mentioned before that you were laid off. Um, you've also had some experiences where people are looking for test automation experience and you had to learn uh to to uh, to fully have those um like different skill sets so did that play an important factor in terms of your contributions now to the community i'll tackle that last part of the question last i need to think on that but i actually have questions to the individual parts uh, the blog started as, um, I started it, I think, when I was nine months into my career in early 2013. Mm. And that was more of a thinking by writing process thing. So I didn't really try to, like, help people or, or anything like that. Um, I just, I think I just, like, wrote whatever was in my mind. Um, and it was just, it was, a blog was a fun way to do that. Uh, but then I think in the past like three years, I started to become a lot more intentional. And then I only started to write things I think could actually help people. Because um, I thought, especially when I was like, not my profile, but like when I started to get asked like the same sorts of questions, it's nice to have something to point people to. Um, and then it was also part of like writing as a way to help me clarify my thoughts. Um, because even with this conversation now, I do find it a bit hard to, to talk to people because it's like my mind is like this massive mess and it has to like tidy up in my brain. I don't know how to describe it. Yeah, it's, so, so writing writing is really helpful for me there. Um, speaking at conferences, I think was to go to conferences for free because it's like harder to like get budget approval to like go to a conference if you aren't speaking. Um, mm. But want but it's harder for a boss to say no when you're speaking <laughs> so um so there's that and i and um and i the travel was quite nice because like you get to go to like a cool place and you're like well i'm there like i think when i went to i spoke at uh, test bash in ireland and then it was close to like some of the game of thrones tour place uh so that was real cool to to like tag on a weekend trip to it and now i don't really speak at conferences because now with two young kids at home what was like a privilege and it's something exciting for me before is now not so much for me to be honest at this stage of my life uh, the youtube channel was more for like visual learning um some people i, I kind of wanted to like share information and i thought the youtube channel wasn't another way to do that and i actually find editing and learning about youtube quite interesting um so it's like this whole world of like retention and, and uh, average view and all this stuff. I actually find it very fascinating to learn. So I'm enjoying learning about something different. So, okay. So the YouTube channel for me, I'm enjoying learning about creating videos. Um, and then they just happen to create a video in the process as well. Mm -hmm. um, the book, I honestly don't quite remember. That sounds weird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think because like this is okay like I can be like a somewhat irrational person so this is someone who like one day just decided to become vegetarian I was a vegetarian for a while like just like I went to bed and I was like I want to be vegetarian like <laughs> and <then> it, was, <laughs> it was like that and then and then I and then after like almost a year or something I stopped and then I was like no now I want meat like <laughs> um, yeah. I was like um, that sounds like a I think like that's kind of what started it so then I started like writing the book in Lean Pub and then after um a bit of time I was like oh actually I think this would actually become something good then I asked for feedback on it because I saw a gap in the market 
for people specifically who are starting their careers mm. that, that addresses like all the things that I wish I knew when I started. I wanted to share that. But it wasn't like I didn't think of I don't I don't remember even like thinking about it. I kind of just started doing it. And I thought like the worst the thing is the good thing about having a blog, it's like worst comes to worst. It would have just been a bunch of different blog posts or or no one would have read it and maybe I just would have shared it with the people I was mentoring at the time. Um and then your last part of the question was around was it like if layoff had being laid off was had something to do with it or was it yeah was like, yeah, yeah. The, the experience that you've had in the past and the need to also learn um more test automation um ooh, i'm not sure i honestly don't know um maybe subconsciously because i know like well, you, like in, in theory with more visibility more like to be discovered mm -hmm. um but i i saw more as the actual learning of skills not the sharing of information being what would help me with my career um but the, the weird thing is was like after a while, I, I couldn't deny the fact that by being more visible, it, it did start to open up doors. Yeah. Um, because, like, I remember I'd been encouraging testers to, like, blog, for example. Um, I even, like, wrote, a, like, a detailed guide on it. Um, and people would come back to me and they'd say, oh, but, like, so someone might not hire me because of, like, the ideas I share. And I thought, well, mm -hmm. you probably wouldn't be happy with them in the first place if they just, like, an idea or even if like you're kind of both self-eliminating in, in a good way um yeah. but yeah I, I the 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 thing about being visible is it opens up doors and then when you walk through those doors then more doors open up mm -hmm. um and that's been like a real privilege because um yeah i mean there have been job opportunities i was i was approached for this role for example um, there's like you know conference talks and so on so it's like it's it's nice having I wouldn't say options but um, ha it's nice having opportunities so yeah yeah I would like to even take it a step further and say that sometimes people think of it in terms of either learning or sharing what you've learned but I think that there's a way to do it at the same time. And that can be a lot more convincing and also a lot more authentic. I'm a big fan of learning in public. And that mm -hmm. is simultaneously learning and sharing it at the same time. And I know that when, I, when I'm learning something, I love watching other people learn. Because when sometimes you learn from an expert, mm -hmm. they speak at a very at a level that you don't understand. It's like it's too advanced. But when I look at the content or or consume the content of someone who's just a few steps ahead of me, they actually mm. call out like obstacles that that I might also encounter or traps that I might fall into. And that's actually way more useful for me than someone who's been doing this for 10 years, who's speaking over my head about things that I can't even begin to understand. And mm. I think that that can be like you were talking about how sometimes when you think about things, Nicola, um, you you have to have it make sense in your head first and that writing can be very useful for that. I find that all the time. Like I'm a huge note taker and I find that if I if I go to a talk or read a book and I don't take notes on it, Mm -hmm. I feel like I haven't fully learned it because I haven't made it made sense of it in my head. And until it's there written in verbal format for me, I don't feel like I've actually learned it. <laughs> no. And and the sad thing is like is like not just a note taking, but like you can like go to conferences or watch talks. And it's interesting how like little sticks, like like if I was to think of like I've gone to a decent number of conferences i've gone to a lot of conference talks max max 10 talks more like five i could actually tell you something about them that sounds like really sad i think that the learnings like enter the subconscious maybe and i'm like applying it but 
notes are notes at least really help especially when I like paraphrase things or mm -hmm. kind of be like okay this thing okay think about how I could apply it in this project or um, maybe you should send um, these recommendations to someone you know but if, if unless I'm like not just writing the notes but somehow finding a way to apply the knowledge pretty soon it's gonna get forgotten for me yeah and that's not very not very ideal I'm on the same um, thinking because um, one objective that I've had for this quarter was to learn a specific product, something that I haven't used before in the past. So for context, mm -hmm. this was Grafana Faro, and it's mm -hmm. used for real user front-end observability, which is something that I have heard of, but I don't have experience of, okay, how do I set this up? How do I uh, make sure that it's sending all the correct data, all those type of things. And what I proposed was, okay, maybe I can set up a small project and then try to inject the script so that we can get the open telemetry data from the application and then see what happens. So it's all about breaking it down into smaller objectives. Mm. Uh, with the overall goal that, okay, maybe in the future, now that I have built um, basic amount of knowledge, then maybe I can help and teach this to other people. And the way I've done that was because I'm, I'm very comfortable with writing. So I started with just conceptualizing everything that I've learned using analogies as well, just to make it much more easier to relate um, with. And then... I've done something brave and submitted a proposal for TestJS Summit to talk about that topic, something that I've learned just a month, two months ago. So again, it's all really about taking that small step. And if there is something that I don't know, I'll just openly say, you know what, I'm not sure. I haven't come across that yet. But if I learn about this in the future, then, then I can get back to you. Because I think one, one thing that people are probably scared of when they speak at conferences or when they share the, their knowledge publicly is that people might criticize them or people might, I don't know, because there, there are a lot of trolls um, online, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But it's just mm -hmm. that y you really have to continuously learn. And I think that is like listening from our conversations that continuous learning has been a key factor of like where we are now. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's like one thing. Not that that specifically helps with trolls, but like with like constantly learning is also being open about the fact that like you don't know everything. So mm -hmm. like at at a conference talk, you know, sometimes you do get asked a question that you don't know, and then you can say like I, I don't know, or you can phrase it like something I look into, or something that is I haven't quite learned about that aspect of my topic yet. And generally speaking people are there to learn like I mean mm -hmm. if you think about like they go to a conference to learn and they're going to ask questions to see like maybe they have a specific problem at work that you might have some input to um there's very there's very few people who are specifically like trying to po poke holes in your ideas and then to to those people because I think there had been a few where I kind of sensed that the intention behind the question was more of um to catch you out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Was yeah. that I didn't really give them that power that I cared. Like, I was like, okay, so what? I don't know something. Yeah. Um, Big deal. I've still given value. <laughs> no, but it's the thing. Like, I've still given value in the talk. I've still like, been able to handle some of the questions. Yeah. It, it, it's actually, like, at the time, it feels very scary. And, like, I, I remember, like, I can feel my body heating up, you know, mm. but... But then I remember when I've gone to other conference talks when a speaker didn't know the answer, you're not like judging them like, oh my God, they didn't know the answer to every question. So there's so there's a value you get from seeing others go through that experience and from your eyes as an audience or spectator, how did you perceive it? And then going through or speaking at multiple conferences and knowing that you can handle these situations. Mm -hmm. But like... Um, Ultimately, like when you when you share knowledge online, whether or not it's through videos, through conference talks, through blog posts, you're not. You, you mean the people we're thinking about isn't the ones who are like eh, with you. It's for the ones who actually have something to learn. And um, 
and there's a lot more lot 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 more of those like people who have something to learn from you than those mm-hmm. little than those little people yeah it's also a um like this important aspect of with, like with the continuous learning that it is a form of investing in yourself because mm. uh you mentioned that uh you got approach uh for this specific role like you didn't apply to that mm. role like someone approached you and i think one of the reasons is because you've made your work publicly you've mm-hmm. documented things it like the 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 different learnings that you've done so it has those privileges that you know we mentioned already mm-hmm. um and you you did mention as well that you like to read non-testing books i think mm-hmm. that's also a form of investing in yourself are there any other book recommendations that you can share with us today because i think we've talked about um cal newport's book show what you got is, is is that is that the name of the so book? good they can't ignore you? Okay, that one mm-hmm. I need to read. Um, I've mentioned uh, mindset by Carol Dweck. Um, are there any other book recommendations that you have for us, uh, Nicola? For I mean, specifically in the area of work, uh, crucial conversations. Uh, I mm-hmm. don't know the author's names, but there's like yeah, um, and then not really work related but i think intelligent investor um, mm. i think it's by benjamin graham um he talks yes, about value based investing yeah so I, I i um i'm now currently reading i think it's called like i can teach you to be rich by remit sethi which isn't particularly useful yes. if someone doesn't live in the u.s to be honest um but i do i've had this conversation with a few people i do wish that they talked a bit about more about how to handle finances and mm the yeah. value of starting young yeah um, it's not it's not a nice topic to talk about money with people but i do have a few friends that we can speak a bit more openly about it yeah. um so that and then there's another book called i think it's called don't split the difference by chris voss um there's there is one concept there um called batna uh, i think it's i think it's best alternative no agreement and I think especially for like job negotiations, I think it's very important to be aware of the BATNA you have going in mm-hmm. um, and how like, um, so, so the idea is like I had heard when I did um, this grad program that th- there were multiple people that I met in this like networking event when we got to the final stage. They were like, oh, just tell them that you have other job offers. And I'm like, but I, at this stage, at this point, I didn't. Like that would be lying. And I I didn't actually, I didn't realize why people were doing that. Years later, read Don't Split the Difference. And people were explaining about, um, he, uh, he was talking about this idea that um, it, it, your, it's like your power in the negotiation it, it depends on your ability to walk away from it if you don't agree. And, not, and while I am definitely not an, a, an advocate for lying, because that's what people were doing, if you do have an alternative in these sorts of things, I do think it helps to talk about it and mention Mm -hmm. that if you are um, um, interviewing at multiple countries, interviewing at multiple companies to say that, or if you Mm -hmm. do have another job offer on the table to say that, um, to to state that you do have a a banner. I think to add some to that book recommendation, um, I recently finished Psychology of Money. I think, yeah, Money and Finance. How was that? I haven't yeah. read the book, but I've listened to podcast interviews with Morgan Hoysel. I've, I've I've enjoyed it. I think um, some of the tips I can't really apply, but most of it, like making sure that you save more, because I, I am into saving, but um, I know some people aren't into it. And mm. uh, it's just one of those things that, um, it teaches you the whole psychology behind it, the whole reason as to why we fall into this materialistic um, kind of way of living and that's and how that's all harmful. So basically deep uh, dive into the different reason why we spend money. So I've, I found it really useful. Mm-hmm. Um, Atomic Habits uh, by James Clear, that's always been uh, one of my deep, top book recommendation especially if you're trying to stick with a particular habit whether that's related to work or that's related to life um 
but maybe for software testing books, um, I particularly enjoyed Explore It uh, by Elizabeth Hendrickson, especially if you want to know more about exploratory testing. Um, I think that's a really great, awesome book. Um, and Leading, Leading with Quality, if I'm not mistaken, by Ronald Cunningham's and Owe Spear. So this was particularly useful for me when I started my role as a quality engineering manager back at Zoopla. And it teaches you how different organizations have transformed um, their quality practices, the different narratives that people might have about testing and quality. Um, so that was that, uh, that was really useful for me to, um, to understand. Um, from a software testing book recommendations, do either of you also have some books that might be useful to people who are going to watch this video? Sure. I really like um, for people who are interested in DevOps and um, quality beyond testing, but just in general, uh, I, I really like the Phoenix Project. From a performance perspective, I, I cut my teeth on high performance websites by Steve Souders and, and the corresponding, the succeeding one, even faster websites, which is really good for front end performance. And I think still really um, like one of the major books that, that a person can read. The Site Reliability Engineering book by Google is, is also very good. But I also want to call out a non-testing book, Deep Work by Cal Newport changed my mm. life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How about you, Nicola? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I also think uh, Deep Work's really good by Cal Newport. Uh, so good they can't ignore you. I think I recommend people reading. Mm -hmm. um, aside from books already mentioned, I would add uh, Lessons Learned in Software Testing, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, mm. and actually reading. This sounds bad. Yes, like Daniel Kahneman. Book. Yeah, that's, that's it actually took me a few attempts to read that book because it's not like, I, I don't know, I had to be in the right headspace to read it. Yeah. Um, don't Make Me Think, um, that's a book on uh, web usability, um, How to Lie with Statistics. I found that quite interesting because in terms of like sharing information, it, I found it interesting how you can like manipulate data or your findings to tell the story you want to tell. Mm. Cause I'd seen this happen with um, managers when I when I was early in my career. How like when they had to deal with stakeholders, that they would present in a way that there weren't so many problems. When you could twist the data in a certain way, and you'd be hearing something different. Um, I got like heaps. I'm actually just trying to think which ones are probably <laughs> worth mentioning. Um, yeah, I talked about deep work. Oh, the obstacle is the way by Ryan Holiday. Um, that's on personal development. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like you talk about how like the obstacle is something that actually could be used to your advantage. Um, but yeah, I, I wrote, I, I realized I, I wrote um, not a book, blog post, a page of recommendations. So I shouldn't just ramble on. Nice. There are I'll, I'll different bullet for points. That, for that link later and then maybe we can share it as part of uh, the video description. Mm -hmm. um, but I just remembered Agile Testing Condensed as well by mm -hmm. Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory, I think that was really useful, especially if you've got team members who are not quite familiar with the whole concept of agile testing. Uh, the condensed version is something that you can read hopefully in a day or two or maybe like three days because it's like really, really condensed. Um, mm. So that's always uh, really good, um, like a book starter recommendation. Mm. Um, but yeah. I think we made it today. We are out of time. <laughs> um, we made it amidst all the technical difficulties that we face um, this morning. Um, but before I finish this, Nicola, um, if you have an advice that you can share to women who want to have a career in tech, uh, what would be your advice to them? The, the first one would be if there are any like woman in tech meetups or anything like that in your um, in your area to, to join them, uh, especially if you happen to work at a company that's like very, very, very male dominated. And because like, I'm just saying like the ratios I've been in, sometimes it's like one in four, sometimes it's like one in like more, worse than one in 10. 
um it can be cool to just like be around people that are similar to you in that way the second would be to there's this book by um by show sample called lean in and i've experienced that there is a double standard where certain behaviors i don't really know like what to do about it like i don't i don't have any advice to how to handle it but mm -hmm. to be aware of the fact that there are certain ways that you could do things that if a guy did it they won't they'll get compliments or they will or no one will say anything but if you do it it won't be good um i've 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 gone through that so i think it helps to to be aware of that reality um and then the last one is from what i've seen is to be aware of being like the admin or note taker in in meetings because what i have found fascinating is how you can like I've told you that the ratio has been like anywhere between like one and four and one and 10. Uh, but like 90, 95% of the time, even more than that, it's always like a woman who's taking the notes. It's always a woman who's like organizing the social activities. Yeah. And I don't quite know why that is, but it's like, I feel like when I look around in the workplace, there's all this thankless work that it ends up being the woman that do, but they're not going to get the credit. It doesn't help them with their careers. And I don't know, like trying to find a way to make to, to even out the field and see that men in your team chip in there as well. Yeah. I'd love to hear your two take on this because. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think you just gave us some idea for a future episode, especially around double standards. So if you would like to be a guest again in the future, I think that would make up <laughs> for a really great episode because yeah. no, there's I think it's true because there are certain ways where if a man did this action and then if a woman did it like for example like with telling people like if it's a woman you're seen as oh she's quite bossy she's you mm -hmm. know not but then if it's a man you're like okay he's an authority or figure i'll respect him more so it would be good to explore all yeah. the other standards yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to talk about what I've seen. I have to like talk because <laughs> we're out of time. Oh. Yeah. I totally agree with the, the double standards um, that you both have mentioned. I, I mean, just briefly, I just want to say that I've steered into it. I have been the woman that takes the notes and I publish those notes and I've learned for it because the, the thing with taking the notes is that it's also pretty visible um, and you can then share it with other people. And I've steered into that and used that as a way to improve my career. So I think there is a way that you can capitalize on things that you do naturally on your natural strengths and use that to your advantage. Mm. That's true. And like with taking notes, I think I've read is that you get to like control history because if you, if you've got the whiteboard pen, <laughs> you've got the pen and paper, then you're, Essentially, that's what you're doing, which is a pretty cool way to look at it as well. Yeah. Well, it was really great to um, have this conversation with you, Nicola. Uh, you've brought some really amazing book recommendations, ways on how you've invested in yourself and just really shared a lot of insights from your career. So thank you again for being with us uh, today. <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Marie. And thanks for having me, Nicole. <laughs> it was great oh. to have you. Yeah. Well, we'll be back again next week, I think. But yeah, hopefully you've all learned a lot from this episode. And with that said, yeah, we're going to finish this episode now. And yeah, we all hope that you all have a great day. Thank you for listening and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.